First we need to find a good piece of cane. I like to start by finding tubes that are 25 milliliters in diameter, keeping in mind that the tubes are not perfect and vary from side to side and center and so on. You can also use this circle tool find at a craft and art store where you, it really helps you see that um, there are variations of the diameter and then it can help you pick the flatter parts more easily. I'm just showing you that there's different ways to look at it. Next, you want to visually examine the tubes. This one I wouldn't use because it's cracked. Um, there's a lot of variations of the bark. Most of these look pretty good. I'm looking at the symmetry of the wall thickness. It's thicker at the top of the bottom. I might not choose that one. This one on the right is more symmetrical, so it's that one on the far right. I'm just comparing them all to each other. Those two look pretty good. Then you want to check the thickness of the wall. We're looking for at least 3.5 millimeters, and in this case, it's very thick, so we don't have a problem here. You can also use this gauge to further examine the arc of the tube. What we want is the most round tube, and you can see by the what is showing in between the cane and the gauge, you can find the perfect arch. Here I'm using the circle sheet to help find where to mark the tube so I know where to cut it to create the most perfect arc of the circle. Which side? I don't like that side. It doesn't look as symmetrical. The other side is a lot better. So I would cut it from that side. It actually, to me, looks really symmetrical. I can't really visually see too much variation there. And then you would just um, use those hash marks on either side, and then that's where you draw your lines for your cuts. I like to split my cane with a chisel and a rubber mallet while wearing gloves. This is very important. You can get a splitting tool which will do all four parts at one time, but I like to have complete control over which pieces to use. This is a good piece of cane, so this isn't an issue here, but sometimes you're, you're not going to be able to use all the pieces. And you might have to change your places where you cut, depending on how the cane is doing that day. And you can split it with your hand also. My favorite tool is the guillotine. Um, it will help you trim your cane without having to measure every cut once you set it properly. This is set to 70 millimeters for a clarinet cane. Um, you can check to see where the flattest pieces are and just trim as you go. It works so well. Um, it might not be cost effective unless you're processing a lot of cane. In my case, I do. Um, there are plenty of other tools you can do this with I can show you after this part, but as you can see, it makes really clean cuts um, and you don't have to trim or measure to trim and it, it's really fast. I think the most common way to cut up cane is to use some sort of saw. So here I am identifying parts of each of these pieces that are, are not ideal. We don't need them and get rid of them. They're not flat or 
the cane um, isn't straight. So um, that's what I'm doing here. What's wrong with this one? Yeah, that one, it's, it's a little less flat at the top there, so I'm just going to cut that part off. Depending on what kind of saw you use, you might have to identify either side. It's easier to cut through one side or the other sometimes. Yeah, that end needs to be cut off as well. I'm going to trim off those unwanted segments with a coping saw with the piece of cane in a vise. This is a very common way to do this, although I know people can use lighter saws with boxes, and, or if you have a jigsaw, you're that kind of person, that, that all works well. Um, I haven't done this method in a while, so it's a little wiggly here. Um, but it, it works pretty well. If you get really good at it, you can be very precise. Um, I had This was a vise I had already had, so it didn't cost anything. The, the saw was five bucks. Occasionally you have to replace the blades, but it's pretty cheap to do this. Um, you can also use garden clippers. Um, these blades are really sharp, so I like to always keep it locked, and I use my gloves. Um, this is fun because, like, once you cut it off, the end part goes flying. So I think you'll get to see that here. Whee! And there it goes. Done. To make the blank flat, we need to plane the segment of cane held in place with a planing bed and cut with a block plane. There are a lot of different block planes you can use, but the, the method is usually always the same. Um, this might be easier if the planing bed were um, held in a vise or a screw down to the table, but I generally travel with this a lot. So I, I prefer to hold it this way. I don't like to do all of my planing at once, so I like to plane little bits at a time. So here I'm measuring the thickness of this plank and it's way too thick. So obviously I need to do some more planing or sanding. Some people really love sanding. I prefer not to do as much since I process so much cane. It's easier for me to do that closer to the finished blank. And pretty much all of these need to be planed again. So I've learned over time and made many mistakes with planing to really only plane little bits at a time. Um, the reason being is that I like to protect the blade on my block plane, so I will retract the blade and store it away. When you're constantly moving the blade of your plane, it's slightly different each time, so it could unintentionally, you could cut off way more than you intend to do. So it's a lot easier to do it this way in stages than taking too much cane off and ruining potential blanks. Um, if you make an error at this stage, it's over, at least in my opinion. So rather be safe than sorry. Um, Always have your gloves on dealing with plain blanks. They are the worst cuts on your finger. You do not want to have them. Once you have this set up for a while, you don't have to keep moving it around and always measure as you go. We're getting a lot closer to a finished blank. We need to shape it. Um, each bead has a unique shape. The shape I'm making here is uh, a Van Doren V12. So I'm actually using that as a model here. 
and I can use this machine. It just matches whatever you can put on it. So I love this machine for my business because I make many different types of clarinet and saxophone reeds, and also for myself. You can make anything with this shaper. This is not very cost effective if you want to make only one shape, and I'll show you that method after this. Um, if you make a lot of reeds and you're interested in this, it's worth it because it's um, really fast once you have it measured to your shape. I'm trying to be as precise as possible here. Here we get to decide where we want the tip or the heel to be. This piece of cane, I'm going to put that, I'm going to try to cut that lower section off to see if I can make a read out of this. So I'll probably have more luck trying to put that at the back, get rid of that off the side. The goal here is to make the, the arch be as symmetrical as possible. And you can see one motion, it cuts off the excess from both sides. Now I'm going to compare with the model B12 to see, and here you can see that um, the blank is still a little bit bigger, so I need to readjust the shaping machine. I think I had previously used the machine to make an E flat reed or a soprano saxophone reed for myself. So when I change the sizes, it takes a while to find the setting that works best. And once you do that, and you could just leave it there and use that and not even really look at it anymore and just run them through the machine. But here I have to take more time to match this up. Before I got to this point, um, I had decided to take all of my blanks and actually plane them a little bit more, getting them closer. So with a, a Van Dorn V12, the ideal thickness that I'm looking for is 3.15 millimeters. So I like to sand anywhere between 3.25 to 3.2 zero millimeters, so I'm not doing too much sanding at one time, but enough to smooth out potential unevenness and make the flattest blank possible. Here I'm going to shape one of these blanks with a single shaper. So this is a Sing a shaper by Greg James for the B12. You could see that it was matching perfectly. So now we have to get the blank in there. Um, I haven't used this one in a while, so it probably would have benefited from having been oiled. Um, you can see I'm having some difficulty moving that, but that's just from sitting around and not being oiled. Don't do that. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of, of these types of shapers available from lots of different people. And if you're going to make just one type of reed, this is the way to go. Um, for my purposes and what I'm interested in, I want to be able to theoretically make anything. So it was cost effective to get that other machine. But this is a great shaper. I highly recommend it. So now we have to trim the excess off and it comes with this little bed that you set the shaper in and then you can trim the excess off with a chisel and if you get this from Greg James he puts this package together and does all of this um, so you get all of these things together which is really convenient and again put your gloves on I probably cut myself at every stage of this process so <laughs> um, just beware um, it's really easy to do this. And then flip it over and do the other side. And it's done.
right after shaping, check each field to make sure they're symmetrical. So now you should measure where the shoulder is on each blank and mark it. The mark is what I like to measure for the thickness of the blank. And I was wrong in this video. Um, it was at this point that I had decided that these blanks needed to be planed again, and you'll see why when, once I measured this one. Um, it's good to check the heel and the shoulder and make sure they're the same or as close to being the same as you can possibly make them. As you can see, this one is a little bit thicker than we want it to be, so more planing is needed. For sanding, I like to start by measuring the blank to see how much I need to sand and therefore what type of sandpaper I need. So that's about my range that I like to start sanding and I start with um, several types of sandpaper. Um, the heaviest grit I'm going to start with is the 220 and um, I typically try to get it to be below 3.2 millimeters thick. Um, start by sanding the sides that you just used the shaper just to smooth it off in the butt too if you want. Um, there are a lot of methods with sanding. Try to not grip the sides and smash it down. It should just be kind of floating along. Um, if you're sanding a lot, I prefer to use this method and then sand it maybe in a circular pattern and keep measuring as you go. There I've reached kind of lower than I wanted for the sandpaper, but I can still finish it with the, the um, finer sandpaper. There you can see the end of this reed is a little thinner, but for me, when I, when I make the reed, I find the shoulder is far more important, so it's really okay there. That's not really that big of a difference. Um, there, that's probably now where I want this blank to be. Almost. It's feeling really smooth at this point. That's a good level to be at. And then just do the lightest to finish it off with this 600 sandpaper. And we're done. Here I want you to see how smooth it is. Hopefully I can get this to focus. It's very smooth and the grains actually look really even. Um, this looks like a good read to me. To make it easier for planing, you want to cut some of the bark off of the vamp area. There are a lot of ways you can do this. You can use a utility knife, a reed knife, anything like that. Um, I haven't used this method in a while and I think my utility knife is probably very dull at this point. So this is taking me a lot longer than what it really should. Usually this is pretty quick. My planing bed comes with a vamp cutter on it, but I find that difficult to work with. So I prefer to use this um, vamp cutting tool by reeds and stuff. It's pretty easy to use and can be pretty quick and it doesn't hurt my hands. The other method seems to hurt my hands a little bit and I do this quite a bit so this is really helpful for me. After you've made your blank or if you have purchased a pre-made blank, um, the next step is to profile the slope of your reed. I really like to use the AW Tools Reed Profiler. The one for clarinet is the RPM 68 
you have a model on one side and then you lay your blank on the other. The model we have here is for the Van Doren V12, but there are so many models you can purchase. I have pretty much most of them, as you can see. Um, I also have the larger version, the RPM82 for tenor sax, bass clarinet, alto sax. Those are not the same profiles, but I keep them in the same box. You can also make direct copies. Um, for this video, we're going to make a Van Doren V12. So to start, you want to carefully um, secure your blank onto the machine here. Um, if you don't hold it down, it moves around as you tighten it in there. And um, you kind of have to line it up by eye, but after you do it a couple of times, it's really easy to do. So it looks like that. Okay, that's focused better now. You can see the line where the cut will begin and the slope of the profile on the other side. What I'm showing you there is a line that will show where the tip of the reed will be. Um, I like to make my blanks a little bit longer so there will be extra at the end that we can work with and clip off as needed. So this works by, there's two different settings on either side and you need to keep them the same so that each side is the same. Um, I like to spend a lot of time profiling. When I first got this machine, I tried to profile too much at one time, particularly near the tip of the reed. That does not work very well with this machine. Try to focus the majority of your time in the back part of the reed more than anything else. It might look like I'm maybe using a lot of effort to push it down and you kind of want to use some effort, but I'm not using the most effort ever because you don't want to gouge the reed either. So now I'm going to mark the tip here and I'm going to measure it with a reed gauge. So the line should be at the finished tip the same, the whole length of that line. Um, so this reed gauge here, it's in millimeters. You want to make sure that it's zeroed before you start. I don't like to assume that it's always zeroed at the beginning of each section, so I need to check it. It comes with different plates. This is the clarinet plate, although I have plates for alto saxophone and tenor saxophone slash bass clarinet. You can measure the center of the reed, the two sides of the reed, very easily with this. So I'm kind of just getting a handle of how much I've taken off at this point. Quite a bit needs to be taken off at this point, you can see. I'm looking to get the tip to be around 0 0.10 millimeters, although it can be slightly less than that, 0 0.09 millimeters or 0 0.11 millimeters. Somewhere around there will work really well. So now we need to adjust the settings on the machine once the blank is back in place. This is another thing you want to make sure as best as you can to always put the reed back the same way. Or conversely, if you've made a mistake initially, you can correct it here. So since you still have a lot of canes, you move off and you realize, oh no, it was a little crooked. You can fix it here at this point.
So I moved it four clicks on the bottom setting. And so I matched that on the top. I'm gonna, whenever you change it, make sure it's matching and keep track of where you were. You never wanna assume that a piece of cane will be exactly the same as the next piece of cane, even if, even if it's from the same tube, because it just doesn't work that way. Um, I like to be really conservative and assume that I'm gonna take off too much. So I try to take off the least amount of cane at a time <laughs> here. Um, and pretty much you end up taking off the line that you drew, so you have to draw it again and check it again. See how much I've taken off. Um, I think I'm trying to show, um, this is an accident I had, I think the second day when I had the machine, I basically gouged off a part of the side. Just don't do that. Like have it set where you're not taking off very much at a time before you get a grip on how the machine works. It hasn't caused a problem. It's just, I see it and it's a mistake that I made and I have to live with it now. <laughs> I'm sure you could replace that side, but it's not needed, but it, I ruined the read as well. So don't do that. Basically with the, the change that I made, it really only took off about a tenth of a millimeter off. We're still quite a ways away from the goal. Some early mistakes I had um, making reads at this point, um, like I said before, was from not focusing at the back of the reed. In particular, not making it as smooth as you can. I mean, that sounds kind of dumb that, that I would have done that, but like, I don't know if it was just really exciting to be like, oh, I'm making a reed. I have to like make it even all over. Since it's thicker at the back anyway, you should be spending more time back there. And then with each pass of each setting that you do, only do a little bit of the tip because that's all that's needed at the time. You can spend more time there later. And what I'm doing is I'm feeling it to check to make sure that it's as smooth and no bumps. It's It feels even. Um, for the purposes of this video, I'm only measuring the tip. When you're closer to the finished reed, you can measure at any point in the reed to make sure that it's as it should be, the sides should be symmetrical, the center should be higher than the sides and so on. Um, I've done this enough with this machine to know that my settings with the dials on the top are correct so that I don't feel I need to do that at this point. I, I trust my model. I trust their, um, their model. So what I'm doing here is I'm just repeating this process until I get to the desired thickness of the tip. And I've pretty much gotten to the end here. Um, the way the settings in the cane ended up being, it's a my setting here um, shows that we've reached um, basically 0 0.10 millimeters. It's a little under, but this is a good place to be. And here we are with our finished read. It looks really good to me, and all we need to do is clip it and test it. So we're going to now clip the reed that we just made with this reed clipper, and then test it. 
So what I like to do here is not do too much at one time because you can't put cane back on a reed. And even though I have followed the dimensions of the reed pretty well here with my tools, not every piece of cane is the same, obviously. And we cannot assume that this line that we use to measure is going to work perfectly for us. So I like to maybe take off half of what's here with a reed trimmer. Um, it doesn't really matter what kind of trimmer you like, it's personal preference. Um, but what I like to do is, there, there was a bunch of stuff on here that you can, it holds your reed down, but I find that that gets in the way, especially if I make a lot of these at one time. So I kind of just, I like to hold it so it doesn't move. And then take little bits off at a time. So that worked okay. There's still some left on the tip above the line and now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna try it. Probably too soft at this point, but we'll see. Yeah, it's too soft. Actually for me, that's a good sign because you know, there's always more you can take off. I like to be in this position rather than, oops, there's no one more to take off. Lighting here. Still a bit too lively for me. Um, let's see. Getting close to that line, I still don't want to cut right at the line. I think it's perfectly fine to take as much time here as possible. Try it again. Okay. It's still a little lively. I, I think I need to do right at the line because before when I measured this on the read gauge it was slightly under 0.1 millimeters anyway at the tip so that might leave some more room but you never know it's better to be safe than sorry <laughs> I've ruined a lot of reads <laughs> by not doing this As you can see, I don't really need to play a lot of notes to figure out how it feels for me, and I'm sure you don't either. Okay, so for today, I think that's pretty good. I ended up trimming it pretty much right at the line, but as I said, that doesn't always work that way. And for now, I'm just going to put it away. I don't like to spend very much time working in the reed right after I clip it because it it changes quite often and my experience for mine they tend to get a little bit harder so that's another reason not to clip too much off of it at one time okay so now we've come to adjusting reeds either ones we've made or commercial reeds so this reed is a read I made at the very end of February, as you can see, 
right before I went on a tour with the Peacherine ragtime group I play in. Um, and since then, my, my reeds last quite a bit, so I used the ones that were broken in <laughs> through now. And now I'm going back and adjusting the ones I made early on that, frankly, had not been played on yet. So while this is an older reed, since it hasn't really been played on and we have some sort of humidity control over here, it really hasn't had much change to it, other than the normal things that happen with a new reed. So um, what happens to mine, the ones I make, is that, I don't know if you can see with the light here, but like the xylems kind of will stick up. This was smooth when I made it, but now I can feel all of these xylems sticking up and they get in the way of the vibration of the reed and we're gonna remove them. So that's what I'm gonna start with with this one. Um, hopefully with this lighting, I can see. Well, you can see. Um, so for this kind of work, I like to use the Reed Geek, although there are so many things you can use. An actual proper Reed knife, just a flat blade, <laughs> sandpaper, you name it. So I'm going to get in here and remove some of these silos that are kind of sticking up. They're mainly over here. So I'm going to start with that. I do not like to do too much at one time. And I don't like to fix the reed all in one day. I don't really think that works very well, unless you're desperate maybe. But I haven't had good results trying to do all of it. Okay, that's a little bit better. So let's see how it plays overall and then we'll go from there. It's definitely resistant. So that's what happens. with these. So you can see here that this was a reed that I had left room at the tip because I figured, oh, it's going to get a little harder later. And it did. So I think it's unbalanced. Slightly. But overall, I think much of it can be taken down. So I'm going to start actually up here. And I like this little edge up here, and you can kind of use it as an eraser. And just take little bits off at a time. a bit better. Um, that might, might even be enough for me to stop for this one day, but for the purposes of this, I'm going to keep going. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is that obviously you could, if you didn't feel like adjusting <laughs> with the tool, you could like redo it here. Or if you have another profile, you could just run it through there if you really want it. I don't think that's necessary all the time. That would be if I had an older read and I really liked it and I, I wanted to clip the tip some more, but then the proportions down here wouldn't be quite right, then I would run it through and profile it again and like it would probably like bring it back here some more and then it's basically like new cane all over again in some ways. Um, I think it just needs an overall just kind of scraping. Don't be afraid to scrape. It's just cane. It doesn't know what it's supposed to be. 
you tell it what it's going to be. All right, I need to try this again. That's already a lot better. And I'm just playing one there. I like to test, um, at least with a slightly older reed or reed that's not precisely brand new, some just like a high C, just to see if it comes out easily, how it is like. You know, if I can even do that. This is much better than it was already. So for me, this would be enough for one day. Um, I might want to take some very fine sandpaper and kind of just, this is a bit, kind of fold it to however you want. There's so many ways to do this. You can buy chunky sandpaper things and cut them off you just lightly. Smooth over what you did. It's a lot smoother. Nothing's sticking up now. It's going to vibrate much better. Okay, we, we have a bit of extra time here, so I want to use this time to talk about E flat clarinet reeds and also adjusting commercial reeds. And since I no longer play commercial clarinet reeds, I figured this would stand in. Um, so the, for, for me, there's several problems here. One of them is the um, typical E flat clarinet reeds don't really work for me. Um, and I think the main issue, I'm sure there are many others that I have not thought about, um, but the main one is that this style barely covers the window of the mouthpiece that I use, which is a faux San Francisco which I really like. Um, it covers it, it works, but for me, it feels like I get a rather gritty tone and it's not for me. So something a lot of people like to do are to take Van Doren White Masters, which are slightly narrower than regular clarinet reeds and use them instead. And as you can see, it's a much better fit up here. It's definitely long enough. And the only thing that needs to be done is to trim off the bottom. But now that I showed you, you can just use garden clippers to just, you just, you just trim it off that way. It's really easy to do. That's pretty much all you need to do there. If you really didn't have a straight line and you weren't comfortable with it, you could sand it down, but there's really not much of an adjustment to do there. Um, for me, these work fairly well. Okay, so here's my modified Van Dorn White Master. And I just played it, I'm gonna be playing it again, but in general, it was just a little more resistant than I would like. I kind of don't feel anything really sticking up, but since it's resistant, I'm just going to try to take it down all over, like with what I did with the other one. So I'm just scraping here lightly overall. Um, now I'm going to get into the tip. Oh, going too crazy. Let's see what this sounds like. That feels pretty good. And just for fun, I'm going to adjust an E-flat clarinet read I made using all of the procedures before. And I profiled it with this white master profile on the machine and then trim for size. So let's see what it sounds like right now. 
I made this a couple of days ago. It actually feels pretty good. It might be a little unbalanced. And I'd like to use some other tools just to show that there's lots of ways to do this. Um, it's a little uneven over here because I cut the vamp with a utility knife. Um, but I think that's fine. I feel some very unevenness in this area. So you could use this again. Um, in this instance, I'm going to use some 220 sandpaper. Kind of, you don't have to waste the whole piece doing that and just kind of go at it with it like this. Okay, that appears to be gone. It feels even freer. Um, the other thing you could use, this is a set of sanding papers that Michael Lowenstern sells. Um, I think these are also by 3M but he assembled a set of different grits of papers. I believe this is the grittiest one. It's like a step down from this. I'll just sum it up that way. I'm gonna kind of go in there with this and move a little bit more, but also try to smooth it out. Feels pretty good. It actually feels pretty good to me. Yeah, I would definitely feel comfortable playing on that and, and the White Master I adjusted for sure. 